Support for Katrina 10 Years After, A Second Life, A Second Chance, is provided by First NBC Bank, a New Orleans-based financial institution. Our employees saw and experienced the devastation and heartbreak of Hurricane Katrina and the rebirth of our city and state. First NBC Bank, member FDIC, the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation, and the Gulf Coast Innovation Fund at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Proud to support this program in appreciation of those who came together to bring New Orleans back over the last 10 years. Promotional support provided by the Board of Commissioners of the Port of New Orleans. Called the Gateway to America, the port played a critical role in the rebuilding of Louisiana following Hurricane Katrina. The Port of New Orleans, our connections run deep and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. I came here many, many years ago just to visit. The minute I set foot here, I knew I was home. And the art, the music, the culture, the people, the food, I mean, there's no other place to be. <laughs> really. I just remember uh, back in 05 when Katrina happened, my family uh, had some uh, real hardship and it was devastating. I mean, it was terrible. But now coming back, it's like the city is... It's re rebuilt. It's rebirthed. I mean, it's a whole brand new city, and it's it's just amazing. In many ways, the people of New Orleans have achieved what seemed almost unimaginable a decade ago: the resurrection of one of America's most beloved cities. In 2014, tourists spent 6.8 billion dollars in New Orleans more than any other year before or after Hurricane Katrina. But New Orleans isn't just a place to visit. For the people who live here, 10 years is not very long, and the so-called road home to New Orleans has been rougher for some than for others. I just went everywhere trying to get help, but it seemed like it was no lead way, nowhere. Many of Katrina's survivors will never return to New Orleans, but others? Both long-time residents and new arrivals have come here together, determined to rebuild their city. Maybe better than before, if they can, because it's home. It was really necessary for us to rebuild our lives to do the things that would make it whole again, and that was only at home. Well, basically, everything after Katrina is a second life. It's not about what we went through in 10 years, it's about the fact that I'm here 10 years after and I can still celebrate and I can still be happy. remember for the rest of my life the smell and the feel that was going on right when the storm came for a moment or two before the storm it felt almost spiritual and special and then the winds picked up more and I saw the Mississippi River starting to blow backwards it just looked like an ocean just pouring backwards This storm was barreling towards us. People in this area had lived through many of them. Hurricanes come, hurricanes went. It wasn't until really the last couple of hours where people really began to realize how ominous Katrina was. Ironically, on the first night for the first couple of hours, although it was harrowing, we thought that we had really kind of dodged the bullet. 
And it wasn't until a little bit later, after a pregnant pause, when the levees broke, that the whole ball game changed. And that's when the city, at least in New Orleans, began to flood. It was something that no one had ever seen before. Images of what appeared to be the total destruction of an American city. Most watched from afar. However, there were some who remained in the city to witness what the rest of the country could not bear to imagine. We did what we were supposed to do. We tried to get out. We tried to seek refuge. And we were fighting circumstances that we had no control over. Robert Green has lived his whole life in New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward neighborhood. He and his family tried to travel inland to safety, along with more than 1.2 million other people evacuating the area ahead of the hurricane. We left Sunday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, got on the road, and the road trip to Baton Rouge that normally took an hour was estimate to take about 14 hours. My mother was so sick that we came back. About 3.30, we went to the Superdome, tried to get in. Because the lines were so long, we had to go to special needs. They weren't set up, told us to come back home. We didn't expect anything like we got. Four o'clock in the morning, my brother woke us up. Robert, we had water in the house. So we had to kick a hole from inside the house to get onto the roof. Get on top of the roof one by one. He reached me, the grandchildren. And we get on the roof and then think, well, now we're safe. And then the house to the left hit us. The house to the right hit us. Pushed us off the foundation. Pushed us into the current. And away we went floating up the street. We hit a tree pushed into the water. My granddaughter was washed away. When I put her on the roof of the house, turned around to get her two sisters, turned back around and she was gone. Nothing we could do. And literally, my mother drowned trying to get uh, from the spot where we were. After Nene fell in the water, Sanaya jumped in the water. Remember doing that? Dumped in the water, actually swam down the front of the house, down the side of the house, to a big truck that actually helped us get out the water. So she did a great thing that day for us, did a great thing for her sister, and did something that I didn't even think about doing, was actually jumping in that water. How old she was? She was four years old when she jumped to 25 feet of water. Hurricane Katrina left New Orleans adrift. The storm struck on August 29, 2005. But floodwaters lingered for weeks, covering as much as 80% of the city. The official death toll was over 1,500. No one really knows for sure how many were lost. Corpses were still being discovered well into October. The majority of New Orleans population was scattered around the country, now homeless. Some wondered whether, for the first time in history, America should abandon one of its major cities. For others, though, there was only one answer to the question of rebuilding New Orleans. It's real simple. Uh, this is home for me. Now get another one. Get the book. You like that book? Show him the book. What book you got? Animals. Uh-oh. Uh he said animals. Okay. This was the only place that I could actually live my life again. To really bring things back to normal, we had to come back to Tennessee Street. To just reclaim what my mother had for us, this house, this land, the flag that I fly was because of the rights she gave to us. The steps we're sitting on are the back steps. Actually, the only thing left of my mother's old house my mother was a fighter. She was pushing us always to at least finish school, go to college, find a career, and do the right thing. For Nene, probably the most I remember about her was how much she liked to stay over here by me. She was just a shadow, you know, always following me around, always here, never wanting to go home. 
this is home for me. This is where I grew up playing football in the street. This is where my children grew up playing football in the street. And actually, this is where I used to walk the neighborhoods every day uh, with my granddaughters. Ten years after the storm, not everyone has returned. As with other neighborhoods, much of New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward remains an abandoned wasteland even today. Many former residents would prefer to return, but before you can rebuild a home, you have to prove the property was yours in the first place. That's difficult to do when vital documents were washed away or old homes were simply passed down between family members for generations without formalities. The house was livable before Katrina. Once Katrina hit, it seemed like the home was gone. And we applied for road home. We tried and tried. We couldn't get any assistance because of the deeds. My mother died. I was uh, 16 years old when my mother left here. I remember her living to pay the last house note uh, on the house. My mother had 16 children. They told us it was too many heirs, so we couldn't get no help. And the city was on me, they was on my family. They were gonna tear the home down, and I went there on my knees. They gave us time to get the house fixed. So I was on a porch one day when I came from City Hall, and this guy passed from Lord9.org. He asked me what was going on with the home, and I told him. And from that point, they came on board, and they did help me out. So like a lot of Lower Ninth Ward families, Allison and her, uh, her family are slowly saving, um, working, buying a few materials, working, buying a few more. And as they're able to purchase materials for this project, we're able to come in with the volunteer labor and um, yeah. meet her halfway. Yeah, take the other drill down and just power point down there. What we've been doing, we've been giving fundraisers. We've been having like uh, dinners. We'll sell suppers. So this is the way we have been buying the materials, you know, in order to deal with what the house thus far. You know, it's just been a hard test. I feel with the destruction that we had, we shouldn't have to go through this. We didn't ask for this. The government should give us more access to what needs to be done because for one thing, we do have the deeds I would think they should have gotten the paperwork in order for us to get our house back up to par. It seems that there are a lot of steps that people have to take to just get simple assistance to, you know, repair their home where, it, like Ms. Robinson said, it wasn't her fault. It's just kind of like they're caught in this circle where they're unable to get assistance and they're unable to get the resources to get the assistance. So there is no problem with getting it fixed. The real issue is where are you going to get the funds? You know, most of our homeowners are hardworking family people who don't have a lot of disposable income. They're living on fixed incomes or they're, you know, they're working somewhere in minimum wage jobs, you know. They're hardworking people who are trying to get back into their homes and we're just trying to meet them halfway. So if you come to the Ninth War, you know, there are a lot of lots that are empty. So even if people are moving back into their home and, you know, trying to make their community come back together, if these lots are empty from, you know, where a home was demolished or was completely destroyed, it's hard to rebuild a community. I think conservative estimates have the recovery of this community taking another decade, and I think that's optimistic. I think we're going to be around for a while. Hoping to get the interior walls with sheetrocking. Well, first, got to go through the electrical and the plumbing. Population return here is 34 percent. It's almost 60 percent below the city average. The story of New Orleans recovery has not been the same in every neighborhood, nor even for every family on the same street. But there's one part of the story that's been true for just about everyone throughout the city. It hasn't been easy. Residents have learned to rely on themselves and on their neighbors. The fourth the struggle was dealing with the simple fact of the matter that the help that should have came didn't come. But it came from volunteers, it came from people like Brad Pitt, it came from Habitat of Humanity. You know, people who really cared enough about us volunteered to make sure that we were able to come back home. Perhaps better than anywhere else in the nation today, ordinary people in New Orleans have come to understand what gives a city its life. They recognize that whole communities flourish or fail depending on small, everyday things taken for granted elsewhere. 
good local schools, churches, and health clinics, neighborhood restaurants, and small businesses. Basic services that enable families prosper. After we rebuild, we noticed the lower Ninth Ward didn't recover like the rest of the city. Uh, we didn't have a grocery store, didn't have a laundry room. It was lacking a serious amount of infrastructure. You have to catch three city buses just to make groceries to feed your family. And that's, that was unacceptable. So we decided to turn this here building, which you see now, into the first grocery store in this part of town. When we first walked through this here building four and a half years ago, this is what it used to look like. Keisha didn't know I was taking this picture of her, uh, and she looked up and I said, you wanna do this here? And she looked up and looked around and she said, yeah, let's do it. And the only way people can recognize this building of what it looks like now and back then, is this little bitty spot on this wall right here. That's that wall right there. So we came a long, 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 long way. I have no regrets. We would do this all over again. We did have some help from uh, Marquette University, you know, some volunteers uh, through Milwaukee that came down. We used to sell everything out this window. This is where all the magic started. From the grocery store window to where we are today, as you can tell, we have a little bit of everything. We have canned goods, water, you know, drinks. We have a little bit of everything. I want to open up a laundry room, uh, a notary public. The Lord Knight Ward needs all of this here. And I'm going to continue to fight until I can get my community to look like the rest of the city. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Grassroots efforts was the thing that kept us going and the thing that kept us, you know, hold. We have everything it takes to make us happy. And basically what I'm saying to you is the first important thing that I got back when I came home was a gumbo pot. We lost everything, so I was able to actually, you know, do that. To taste patent hot sauces, to take cubic pies, you know what I'm saying? So we, life has returned to this neighborhood and those same people that weren't here can come back one day or in this case, we get new neighbors and we take new neighbors just as welcome as the old neighbors. When Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Louisiana, winds were clocked at 125 miles per hour. Downriver from New Orleans, the waters of the Gulf rose and washed over Plaquemines Parish in a storm surge of 20 to 25 feet. But inside the city, the worst destruction only came after the storm had passed, and many residents thought they were safe. That's when the levees broke. Natural disasters can happen, but this was not a natural disaster. This was a man-made disaster. Relying on a complex system of levees, walls, pumping stations, and other flood control measures, the city depends on good engineering for its survival. The day after the storm, it was clear that the engineering had failed catastrophically. The federally constructed levee system was breached in 53 places. The designs were done so that you know, the levees were good to a particular uh, surge elevation. And once that elevation was reached and exceeded, the whole system failed. Surrounded by water, New Orleans is virtually an island, and today much of that island sits below sea level. Well, we're standing on the, uh, one of the gated structures of the surge barrier here out in uh, eastern New Orleans. Um, it's one of the biggest surge barriers in the world. It's about uh, a little less than two miles long. The function of this particular structure is to keep the surge from reaching the heart of the city. If you look at the overall system, including the East Bank and the West Bank, and some interior drainage, um, it's about $14 billion. There is a cost share required on some of this, um, to the tune of about 30 to 35 percent. So the state of Louisiana, as a non-federal sponsor, is ultimately responsible for that cost share. The system is ready. But the question always is, you know, can this system hold back anything that Mother Nature can throw at us? And the answer is no. Until recent decades, 
nature protected the city. It's the areas outside of that city that afford all the protection for that city. They allow the city to be there in Southeast Louisiana. We live in this delta, this great delta built by the Mississippi River, and uh, we lived here relatively safe for, for hundreds of years. And as these marshes and ridges and barrier islands start disappearing, they make us more vulnerable to storm surges. And uh, those cities are in great danger because of that reason. And Katrina showed that quite convincingly. Kerry St. Pei is a marine biologist and emeritus director of the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary, a 4.2 million acre wetland outside the city of New Orleans. That protective estuary is undergoing the fastest land loss and sea level rise on the planet. St. Pei and his family have been first-hand witnesses to the environmental changes that brought about the flooding from Hurricane Katrina. I grew up in this area and uh, I played in these marshes and uh, as a young kid swam in the marshes, hunted in the marshes and uh, saw it gradually disappearing. Most of the people that live here now can trace the ancestry back hundreds of years. That's a very unique thing. You know, nowhere else in the country, very few places, have that uh, characteristic. It's important to remember this place has collapsed. It collapsed from a place of relative safety to one in which everybody is in jeopardy of getting wiped out by hurricane storm surges. My first ancestor had hurricanes, just like we have hurricanes, but he had vast marshes protecting his home and his land. We no longer have that. Uh, the land has disappeared. The place has collapsed while we have been here. Public attention is focused on the calamity that New Orleans suffered 10 years ago. But the city does not exist in isolation from the environment around it. To understand how Hurricane Katrina virtually destroyed New Orleans, it's necessary to know why the city was created here nearly 300 years ago. It's always been a great port city. The reason that it was created to start with was because of commerce and trade. Under the French colonial governor Bienville, New Orleans was a carefully planned city that its founders hoped would open the wealth of North America to the world. It's at the mouth of the Mississippi or close to it. Bienville decided to build there and uh, nobody's ever thought really about leaving it. New Orleans occupies a pivotal place in the geography of this continent. By 1803, it was well understood that the port city would also play an equally pivotal role in the history of the young United States. Remember when Thomas Jefferson went to France to uh, ostensibly you know, do what became the Louisiana Purchase, he wanted one thing, they wanted control of the city of New Orleans. If you controlled that, you controlled all the commerce of the hinterlands of America. You know, Thomas Jefferson earned his keep as one of the great American presidents by understanding that the Mississippi River was the spine of America. The dividends paid by this nation's investment have only grown since the Louisiana Purchase. I truthfully feel that the rest of this country doesn't recognize the significance of this port in this area. 40% of all commerce passes right in front of the World Trade Center here, right at the foot of Canal Street. I think the concern of the White House of this port post-Katrina was strictly about the role that we play in the total economy of our country. Okay, if New Orleans falls, will the port fall? Will the economy collapse? This part of the river, the Lower Mississippi River, constitutes the largest single port system in the United States or North America. 500 million tons of cargo a year move. Every day this river is closed, the economic consequence is $3 million a day to the economy of America, and it grows exponentially after the fourth day. 
If this port closes, it's a huge detrimental economic consequence to the entire country. The same unique geography that makes the city of New Orleans so indispensable to America also makes the city vulnerable to hurricanes like Katrina. We build our houses, communities, infrastructure on the high land, uh, and that's the land right next to major rivers or uh, where the river once went through. The ridges that were left by the overflow of the Mississippi River historically are the places where the heavier particles settled out from the water column. So we go to the water to build our houses. Uh, different than other places in the country, they go away from the water because there are rivers and valleys. Port Zoffer is right along the natural levee of the Mississippi River. The river is right behind me, uh, you know, about 100 yards. If you look at a map of Louisiana, all the communities are settled on these natural ridges. And it's the wetlands between these natural ridges that afford the protection for the communities. Without the wetlands, the communities can't exist. So for hundreds of years, we were protected by the webbing of these natural marshes. But those marshes that once shielded the city from hurricanes have disappeared, due primarily to human interference with the Mississippi River and the neighboring wetlands. These changes in the land allowed Katrina to cause a degree of destruction greater than any hurricane to come before it. Well, this is a community that has weathered many, many hurricanes. But after Katrina, when I first flew over it, it was about a week after the hurricane passed. Uh, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Uh, you know, I didn't even see any structures that, would, that stayed on their foundation. You know, entire subdivisions were, you know, just wiped out. All of the uh, houses were moved. Uh, they weren't in the same place. Uh, they had been moved by the storm surge. And my house was actually right here. The house I grew up in uh, was pushed a quarter mile from, from where we first put it. Um, and this is the subdivision where my, my house was. Well, when I first came here after Katrina, there were three houses on this lot where I grew up, and the problem was none of the houses were, were mine. Friend I grew up next to, Delahousie. He lived there. His house was over there somewhere. It's been moved. Many of my friends lived in here, and uh, you know, the, all of them have moved away. They haven't returned since uh, since Katrina. Uh, it's just the uh, the last straw, you know. Although they survived many, many hurricanes before, it gets tiring after a while, and sooner or later, people just give up and uh, you know decide to to move on and move away. And that's the thing that really scares me the most. Uh, it's gonna be the loss of our culture as people move away. Many, many families with deep roots in the New Orleans area have left, never to return. And for those who did, Coming home was among the hardest things they'd ever had to do. I didn't want to come back. I was outvoted by my kids and my husband. Like, we're tired of air mattresses. We're tired of living out of boxes on the floor. We want our own beds. We don't care. We want to go home. And this was their home. And so I came home. How's the thickness of that coming? Um, hey, see if it I still have some ways to cook. Mark and Connie Udo are from a part of New Orleans known as Lakeview. Before the storm, it was regarded among the city's most upscale neighborhoods. 
Residents there were typically older, affluent, and white. Adjacent to Lakeview is the 17th Street Canal. When the levees and walls that protected the neighborhood were breached, 10 feet of flood water covered the area. Along with the lower 9th Ward, Lakeview suffered the worst of the destruction. We moved six times in four months before we got back into the house, which was January 2006. And living here, you know, in a totally destroyed neighborhood, looked like a nuclear bomb went off. No um, neighbors, flooded, molded houses completely surrounded us. We didn't have street lights for a year. We didn't get mail delivered to our home for a year. So we were living here in the dark. And I told my husband, I don't think I can do this. He goes, look, we're ahead of the game. I have a job, we have a roof over our head, our kids are back in school. You have got to figure this out. I just really began to pray a lot about it. And I thought, if I could start doing something, I'll feel better. She'd heard about volunteers who were living in tents under the oaks of nearby city parks. So I went over there one day. I was like, what are you all doing? What are you all about? And he said, we have thousands of kids here coming in from people from all over the country wanting to help. My story, I feel like, really begins with the recovery. Out of 8,000 homes in the Lakeview neighborhood, Connie Udo's family was the first of 10 families to get electricity again. Their home became like a beacon in the dark. So I ended up opening up my house, bringing volunteers here. I got $1,000 I pulled together, went and bought weed eaters, a lawnmower, you know, whatever I could to try to start cleaning. And that's really where I started. The Udo's family home became the first satellite for Beacon of Hope a grassroots neighborhood organization that worked to assist area residents to begin to rebuild. From the ruins of her own house, Connie served as the group's outreach coordinator. Volunteers coming to my house from the Good News Camp every day, 40, 50 at a time. We would just go down the street and we would clean the dead vegetation and all of the storm debris. You had to build it ground up, so we would see a tree service pulling a tree off of a power line or something, or moving it out of the street, and we'd literally say, give us your name and number. And we'd see someone moving a flooded car, and we'd give us your name and number. Really, that's how we built it. And people were just looking at me like, what? You can help me rebuild, you can help me. I said, I even have volunteers now. We can even help you clean your house up. As others were discovering throughout the devastated city, Connie learned that the only way she could survive here and start over was to begin by helping her neighbors do the same. I remember a little girl when we were cleaning out Rosemary's house, my mom's best friend. And this little, this girl came up to me and she said, you know, Miss Udo, uh, this is my first mission trip. And I was like, mission trip? because we went with our church to mission trips to Mexico to orphanages. Never thought of New Orleans as a mission field. And I was like, mission trip? She goes, oh yes, I'm here with my church and this is our first mission trip. And I remember just kind of being taken back by that. Especially in well-to-do neighborhoods like Lakeview, Americans weren't accustomed to thinking of themselves as the poor, the homeless, the needy. But Katrina forced many in New Orleans to look at ourselves differently, and our neighbors too. Before Katrina, Lakeview had kind of a perception of exclusivity, mostly white, middle to upper class neighborhood. We were a third of the city's tax base, but now we're totally have done a 180 on that. We're very inclusive. The average age pre-Katrina was 50, now it's 30. So we're a young, vibrant neighborhood. People in New Orleans find themselves weighing the same kind of questions asked by its founders 300 years ago. What kind of city do we want for ourselves and for our descendants? In many ways, 
the old neighborhood is the same as it was before the flood. In other ways, it's better. After Katrina, after we got so much water here, it was another Russian before, before us. It's just they, don't, they never want to come back, so they never come back. So after so many years, after pretty much eight years, because it takes two years to build this, pretty much this building, you know, and, uh, and look what we got now. I'd like to see you, please. Thank right you. this way. Yeah, this way. We had some wonderful things tonight. Good, good. You guys always do. Entrepreneur Danny Milan noticed that New Orleans restaurants were reopening mainly in those parts of the city frequented by tourists. Reviving the city's long tradition of small neighborhood cafes and bistros, he moved to Lakeview for a new start. We just opened it last year, you know, actually last week it was pretty much our university, one year that we opened the restaurant. It's Lakeview, they need something like this, with some tablecloths, you know, warm, cozy, you know, I'm very proud that they'd be here and I'm very proud to have this wonderful, beautiful restaurant. We just working so hard to make it a little better and, and, and it's good this restaurant for the neighborhood too. I think Lakeview is strong right now. After 10 years, it's like, wow, this is beautiful. It's gorgeous. I think for me, it's the, 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 uh, the, the best little city or something to live. The recovery of the Lakeview neighborhood has been inspirational to other parts of the city still struggling. This big park here I'm standing in is called the New Basin Canal or New Basin Park. It's on West End Boulevard in Pontchartrain. And all of the trees, at one time this was just a beautiful passive park. Um, everything died. This became the staging ground for FEMA. So all of the debris came and was set here, all of the dead vegetation. Just give it a good pull. There you go. Break up the roots a little bit. So we break up the roots, kind of let it know it's out of the pot. So we have planted 800 trees. Today, I'm doing the last phase of it and we're planting along here 65 beautiful live oak trees. In years to come, this is just gonna be a gorgeous oak tree-lined street again. We had to dig so deep in that we have discovered the champion in ourselves. No one knew we had that much inside of us fight and resilience. While churches, nonprofits, and individuals gave generously to assist the people of New Orleans, getting help from the government would require ordinary citizens to become advocates. It was a situation that just called for action. New Orleans could have gone another way and taken a different path, and there wouldn't have been this happy ending that we're experiencing on the 10th anniversary. At first, assistance from Washington was both too small and too slow. That is, until citizens went to the nation's leaders and persuaded them to see for themselves what had become of New Orleans. After lobbying, nagging, and badgering these elected officials, we did get over $10 billion in road home money, and Congress did allocate sufficient dollars for levee protection and rebuilding. Between the hurricane and the failure of its levee system, the federal government has spent more than $100 billion in the recovery of the city. New Orleans is far better than I ever dreamed we'd be. We've come so far proud of the people that live here, that we pulled ourselves up. I think we surprised the country. I don't think people thought we could do it. We couldn't have done it without the volunteers, though. And, you know, they're still coming in today. In the midst of trying to restore one of America's most historic cities, the people of New Orleans are also inventing one of its newest and most forward-looking. When Katrina hit, we took this responsibility, some people call it an opportunity, it's really a combination of both, to actually build it back, not the way it was, but the way it should have always been. 
You know, New Orleans is constantly reinventing itself. It's always transforming and changing itself. It's not static, and that confuses people because it's a history city. So some people think it's looking at the past. It's just that New Orleans doesn't erase its eras. It allows the, to stay and grow organically, where most cities will take a wrecking ball out on historic buildings. The New Orleans has done a better job than most cities of preserving a lot of what they have. Demographically, at least, New Orleans has changed in the years since Katrina. The African-American majority is now smaller than it was before the storm, while the percentage of other ethnic populations has increased. Reversing the historic outflow into the suburbs, growing numbers of young families are now finding homes within central parts of the city, places once blighted before the storm. However, Katrina and the floods that followed were not enough to wash away some of the city's most chronic troubles, such as crime and poverty. Old problems remain. I think we have a lot of problems that have been inbred for a long time, but we have a very, very long way to go. And I think the real challenge for the people of New Orleans, if she wants to be as great as she possibly can be, is whether or not we can actually sustain a lot of the progress that we've made and be willing to make tough decisions that actually requires sacrifice. You're not going to be the beneficiary, but somebody else is. And we're not very used to doing that in the city, and certainly not in the state. But in a city struggling to revive itself, there's a greater willingness to gamble on new solutions, too. New Orleans has become a kind of laboratory for experimental approaches to critical urban issues, not only here, but throughout the nation. One of those issues is health care. The state of Louisiana has a fairly poor track record in terms of delivering health care to its people. Um, we have some very bad health statistics in this state. Among the oldest continuously operating hospitals in America, New Orleans Charity Hospital was considered one of the best facilities in which to train for emergency medicine. Primarily treating the poor, Charity served 100,000 patients per year before Katrina, but not without serious shortfalls and the disaster 10 years ago made existing problems more evident than ever. We would run out of money towards the end of the year at the public hospital and ration, you know, how many blood draws could we do, how many, did we have enough tubes to actually draw the blood in, and put it in to go to the lab, you know, did we have enough radiology equipment. Hurricane Katrina pushed doctors, nurses, and other health care providers past even their familiar limitations forced them to find new creative solutions to save lives. There are so many community clinics out there right now that are in the neighborhoods where patients can get to them easier. You know, transportation is not as big an issue when you have a community clinic in your neighborhood. Unfortunately, the community clinic in my neighborhood is not available to me. I have a Medicaid card. The plan that I have they don't accept that call. But no single alteration or improvement alone could fix what was wrong with the city's health care system. Real change would require starting over, in some cases, from the ground up. Part of the rebuilding of New Orleans health care after Katrina was not just community health, not just seeing that we had ways for people to pay for care and get a better quality system, but we needed to replace some infrastructure hospitals like the Veterans Hospital and the what used to be the Charity Hospital, it's now the University Medical Center. You have almost 300,000 people in New Orleans East without a full service hospital. You go to the hospital, if you're having a stroke out there, they stabilize you and they send you into the city. And you have to be concerned about if you get caught on the interstate in a, an ambulance, you might not survive the ride to the hospital downtown. For there to be any hope of seeing people return to New Orleans, the city had to create new and better ways to take care of its sick. Now there's a hundred other things that you could point to too, but we knew But to have a sustainable future, New Orleans would also have to completely reimagine its educational system too. The city's public schools were in serious trouble before Katrina. After the flood, they were in ruins. 
Scott Cowan was among the civic leaders willing to take on that challenge. But before he could begin the enormous job of trying to fix the rest of the city's schools, Scott had to work to repair his own first. He was president of Tulane University when Katrina struck. For Tulane University, the most critical areas of focus was to rebuild our campus physically. We realized though in October, November, as we were rebuilding Tulane, that we actually were going to get rebuilt and that we would be able to open up in January. But the harsh reality was in October of 05 and November of 05 was, we didn't know that there was a city for people to come back to. And that's why I began to get then very involved in the recovery of the city itself. I had the responsibility for overseeing the public education. Before Katrina, we had one of the worst public education systems in America. I remember seeing a survey of the 100 largest urban areas, and I think New Orleans was ranked number 96th or 97th. We decided to decentralize decision making down to the school level and really give principals more autonomy than they've ever had before. And then we ultimately decided to do it through the vehicle of charter schools. Today, more than 90% of all public school students in New Orleans attend charter schools, more than in any other urban district in the country. Pre-Katrina, 60 to 70% of schools were F schools. And now, when we look at the number of F schools, it's less than 6%. It's a big departure from the way this city, or any other, has traditionally handled education. I believe the city had many options post-Katrina in trying different things. I think that it was a mistake to go full-fledged into an all-charter school system. Parents in New Orleans no longer have a right to a neighborhood school. They must enter a lottery to get a school period for their child. Over 80,000 residents live in this New Orleans East area. This is one of the largest black populations in New Orleans and the children in these communities have to travel the furthest in the city to get access to a public school. If you are a neighborhood school, the assumption is that oh, there's community already. Well, we realize that actually bringing kids from all over the city means that we have to be really intentional about how we're building school pride. It's definitely a challenge, but it's one that we've really embraced. The question of taxpayer-funded independent schools can be controversial, and it's too soon to gauge their long-term effectiveness here. While other cities debate, New Orleans is experimenting, collecting data, evaluating outcomes. Katrina left this city with no choice but to try something new. We are nowhere near where we need to be and can be. And so that's going to take 10 more years, 15 more years, 20 years, but we can't go back. Sometimes I think people underestimate the importance of self-expression and helping children to discover a means of expressing themselves through the arts. We are trying our level best to expose them to their own abilities and helping them to develop their abilities helping them to understand that they are of value. And that being creative is important, whether you're a writer, a dancer, or singer. We bring a new kind of mm, spirit, if you will, to what each child accomplishes. This is one of the cities that Really, some of the great jazz musicians come out of it. They had a lot of music in the city. And it started here and developed. So it's important that these kids learn to keep the tradition going. In 
In trying to recover itself, New Orleans has confronted a challenge that's unfamiliar to other younger cities in America. How can we create a new and better future for ourselves without sacrificing our historic identity? More than in other places, maybe, this is a crucial question. There are so many reasons why New Orleans is indispensable, but I would start with culture. Well, that matters, that's who a nation is, that's our identity. And if you look at the uh, amount of great gifts, cultural gifts that the city gives us uh, as Americans, not just cuisine or poetry or jazz music, but an aura, a place that everybody in the world romanticizes. And it's not an accident that you get people like Tennessee Williams and Louis Armstrong and Jelly Roll Morton, and the list goes on and on of figures that are loved around the world because they represent what's best in America. Add to that the fact of the, the mythical Mississippi River. Oh, so much of our country's history takes place along the river. In New Orleans, is the payoff. In a country, the United States, that often is seen as puritanical and the work ethic, New Orleans gives us a reprieve from that. It tells people it's okay to have fun, it's okay to have parades, it's okay to do a Mardi Gras party, it's okay to enjoy life, not just work life. The first Mardi Gras after Katrina was a, a special moment um, because the city was so broken. And some people refer to it as looking like Paris after the war. Many people felt that how could you dare hold a big party when we're so, there's so much suffering and grief and loss in the city. But then many people felt like, wait, this is the heartbeat of our city. There are festivals and our celebrations and our Mardi Gras. It's in our soul. It's, it's what we do. It gave people a break, an excuse to take a break from all the issues that they woke up every morning facing. Still reeling from the disaster, New Orleans first had to remind itself who it is as a city and that we are still here. It just, I think, really touched the souls, got into the souls of the people and, and um, it was a wonderful day. You learn how to live, how to live with one another. Thank you for returning to New Orleans. Love you, honey. Yeah. And I find that is what's happening in this city, that we are coming together more than we ever came together. There was a feeling that we would lose the culture of New Orleans. I think actually the opposite has happened. I think what's happened instead is that music and culture in general has led the return and the recovery. Because natives simply couldn't do without the life. They wanted to be back here. But it's the people, the actors, the players that really enliven it, whether on the second line or carnival. And I think there is a deep and profound understanding and reminder of that that came about as a result of Katrina. No waterline on music, no waterline on the soul. And uh, it's a simple thing, but it's, it's a profound thing. After Katrina, the second line is our way of showing our happiness for what we've been through. And trying to take that happiness, that sorrow, and put it into a spiritual or uh, a more exciting mood 
and that's what we do. We take that and just throw those feelings up in the air, and the music grabs it, and our feet start moving. The second lines are our chance after what happened to do something good. Support for Katrina, 10 years after, a second life, a second chance, is provided by First NBC Bank, a New Orleans-based financial institution. Our employees saw and experienced the devastation and heartbreak of Hurricane Katrina and the rebirth of our city and state. First NBC Bank, member FDIC, the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation, and the Gulf Coast Innovation Fund at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Proud to support this program in appreciation of those who came together to bring New Orleans back over the last 10 years. Promotional support provided by the Board of Commissioners of the Port of New Orleans. Called the Gateway to America, the port played a critical role in the rebuilding of Louisiana following Hurricane Katrina. The Port of New Orleans, our connections run deep and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. <laughs>